Bonjour aux gens euh, ici et aux gens dans les euh, sites distants. Bienvenue, merci d'être ici euh, nombreux. Euh, J'ai le plaisir de euh, vous accueillir et de vous présenter le docteur Gordon Gallet qui m'a fait promettre que la présentation serait très rapide. Euh, évidemment, la présentation n'est plus à faire. Euh, le docteur Gallet est un professeur à l'Université McMaster, quelqu'un dont on compte plus les contributions autant en tant que chercheur, mais aussi en tant que euh, pédagogue euh, et c'est quelqu'un qui a maintenu sa euh, pratique clinique qui va nous parler aujourd'hui justement de comment on peut réconcilier ou, ou euh, orchestrer cette espèce de triangulation là euh, entre recherche euh, clinique et enseignement euh, dans le monde de la, de la recherche dans le système de la santé. Alors on le connaît pour plein de raisons, euh, c'est à lui d'ailleurs qu'on qu doit le terme euh, médecine fondée sur les données probantes. Euh, il est officier de l'Ordre du Canada et euh, chercheur de l'année en 2013 euh, aux, euh, aux instituts de recherche en santé du Canada. Euh, C'est à peu près aussi court que je peux faire pour euh, vous euh, communiquer l'importance que sa présence chez nous a à mes yeux, en tout cas. Donc j'espère que vous allez apprécier sa présentation autant que moi et que vous aurez plusieurs euh, questions à la fin. En tout cas, thanks for being with us. Thanks very much. Pleasure to be here. So I'm going to talk about evidence-based medicine, and I'm going to take a historical approach, starting with the key principles of evidence-based medicine, and in doing so, I'll introduce you to some of the people who were responsible for developing uh, and for the progress in evidence-based medicine and its evolution, and then, uh, toward the end, talk about challenges for the future. So, Uh, one of the issues when it got started was that there were not well worked out systems for deciding what evidence would be more or less credible. And the first individual who took a real run at that was David Sackett, who was my mentor and the mentor of other people I'm going to introduce you to in the course of this talk. And David Sackett came up with a hierarchy of evidence for therapeutic questions. And at the top of that hierarchy is randomized trials, which are now generally accepted as the optimal way to establish whether treatments are beneficial or how beneficial or harmful they are. If you don't have randomized trials, you may have observational studies that look at outcomes that are important to patients. And basic research and clinical experience are still sources of evidence, but are less credible than often done observational studies and certainly randomized trials. Uh, the, it took about a decade or so after evidence-based medicine um, uh, was more at least a critical appraisal uh, and the hierarchy of evidence was really established to for the uh, Uh, what became the evidence-based community to realize that single studies were still problematic. We needed systematic summaries of the evidence to really know what to do. And this gentleman, Ian Chalmers, was the guy who is primarily responsible for the Cochrane collaboration, which has a worldwide mission of summarizing all the randomized trials known to humankind and is up well over 5,000 of such summaries now. Um, this is a, uh, this, this uh, story goes with this slide, and it's a story of why we need systematic reviews. This is something called a cumulative meta-analysis of thrombolytic therapy for myocardial infarction, clot-busting therapy. This 1.0 down the middle means no difference in death rates whether patients receive thrombolytic therapy or they don't. Over here, thrombolytic therapy would reduce the death rates by half. Over here, it would double the death rates. Uh, the dots here represent the point estimates or best estimates of effect as the data accumulated and the lines around it represent the 95% confidence intervals, the range of plausible truth. The first randomized trial of thrombolytic therapy occurred in the late 1950s and enrolled only 23 patients, and as a result, a very wide confidence interval. The second trial enrolled not 65 patients, 
but 42. This is a cumulative meta-analysis, so the numbers here are the totals in all trials up to that point. And you can see when it was less than 2,000 patients in seven trials, the confidence interval still overlaps no effect. It becomes significant at about 10 trials and 2,500 patients, confidence interval no longer overlaps no effect, and we start to get p-values below our typical level of significance of 0.05. Now, we could discuss when the answer was in about thrombolytic therapy, but probably most of us would agree by 30 trials over 6,000 patients, the boundary of the confidence interval here is a long way from no effect, and we're getting quite uh, low p-values. So in that vicinity, the answer was in. Did that stop people from doing randomized trials of thrombolytic therapy? No, it did not. There were another 40,000 patients enrolled in randomized trials of thrombolytic therapy after the answer was in, half of whom did not receive the life-prolonging benefits of thrombolytic therapy. So the question arises, why did we have to enroll 40,000 patients after the answer is in? I think a big part of the answer to that question is on the right side of this slide, which is the recommendations that were appearing in textbooks and current reviews as these data were accumulated. It goes anywhere from some authors saying thrombolytic therapy should be routinely administered, specific conditions, calling it experimental, or not mentioning it. And two things I'd like to point out about this. First is major expert disagreement. So in the mid to late 1980s, you have some experts saying this should be the standard of therapy, some saying only for specific patients, some calling it experimental, and some not even mentioning it as a possibility. And it was a full decade after the answer was in where we finally get a consensus among the experts. And the trials were saying at the time. Yeah, and I'm very ambitious. You will insist on set the view of the shared book, which is why the presentator is minuscule in the screen. Is there a way to do that? Uh, on vous entend dans la salle à Sherbrooke, à Longueuil. Je ne sais pas si on peut avoir la discussion euh, hors ligne. Merci. Oui, allô. Est-ce que la question a été adressée à nous à Sherbrooke ou on va essayer de régler votre problème? Continue. So, uh, so it was a decade. Uh, and they just, people, the trialists kept doing trials till finally they got a consensus. So two points there. Number one, this expert disagreement, uh, the consensus finally coming only after a decade after it should have. Here's another example, again, from the uh, treatment management of patients with myocardial infarction. Uh, 35 years ago, when I was a resident in a coronary care unit, Every patient who came in the door, we started a what we call a lidocaine drip, an infusion of the antiarrhythmic lidocaine. Why? Because we knew patients were at risk of lethal arrhythmias, and as I rotated through the coronary care unit, I was told we were going, I was going to prevent these arrhythmias by giving lidocaine. Was there ever any randomized evidence supporting this practice? No, there was not. Right from the first trials, the signal is on the harm side. Here's benefit, here's harm. Increase the signal on the increase in mortality with lidocaine. As the data accumulated over 20 years, we never proved harm, but we certainly excluded benefit, and it's quite possible we were killing people. Certainly we were exposing them to the adverse effects of lidocaine. Did this evidence stop the experts from recommending lidocaine? No, it didn't. Throughout the 20 years when these data were accumulating, most of the experts were recommending lidocaine, and that's why I was giving it. Once again, you have the expert disagreement. Some yes, some no, some not mentioning lidocaine. So, two messages from these. Uh, number one, this why, this great expert disagreement, 
a decade behind the times, and actually making recommendations that contradicted the evidence. Now, you'll notice that these, uh, these are old stories, they end about 1990, and I can't, I could tell some maybe bad stories, but nowhere near this bad since then. Why not? I believe that a major reason is that about 1990 was when systematic reviews and meta-analyses became uh, widespread and popular, and I believe that if the authors had had the systematic reviews and meta-analyses available, they would not have been contradicting the evidence, and they would not have been a decade behind the evidence. So, uh, we now know how to judge the credibility of the evidence. We now know that we need systematic summaries of the best evidence to deliver the best care, but there is a process of going from evidence to clinical decisions. Uh, Brian Haynes, pictured here, was chair of our department of clinical epidemiology at McMaster for a decade and is one of the people who has contributed to the understanding and development of going from evidence to clinical decisions. And the basic message, is, it's a bit of an irony about evidence-based medicine, one of the principles is evidence never tells us what to do, it's evidence in the context of values and preferences. And I'm going to illustrate that with a story of work done by a colleague of ours at McMaster now, uh, P.J. Devereux. And uh, P.J. Devereux uh, asked a question to clinicians and patients, and uh, I'm going to ask you the question that P.J. Devereux asked in a, little, in a little while. So it has to do with patients with atrial fibrillation who are at risk of stroke. And in the scenario that Dr. Devereux gave to uh, his participants, uh, physicians and patients, was that in the uh, course of two years, uh, patients who are, do not receive anticoagulants would suffer 12 strokes, six major strokes and six minor strokes. They would also suffer three serious gastrointestinal bleeds. Anticoagulation would decrease the number of strokes to four. So it would prevent uh, a total of eight fewer strokes. It would prevent four major strokes, four minor strokes. And the question that Dr. Devereux put to his study participants, that I'm going to put to you in a moment, is given those reduction in 12, uh, from 12 to four strokes, eight fewer strokes in 100, how many bleeds would you accept in 100 patients over years and still be, as a physician, willing to recommend anticoagulants or a patient to use it. And what Dr. Devereux then did is to make sure his patients and his physicians understood what it was like to have a stroke. So in this slide you see how Dr. Devereux described to his patients and physicians what it was like to have a minor stroke and what it was like to have a major stroke. And he also <coughs> described what it was like to have a major gastrointestinal bleed, and this was his description. So he got the patients educated about what it was to have a stroke and a gastrointestinal bleed, and perhaps also titrate the physician participants to say, here's the strokes we're talking about, and here is the gastrointestinal bleeds we're talking about. So, back to the choice, and this time I'm going to want you to participate. Without treatment, 100 patients will suffer 12 strokes, 6 major and 6 minor. If you give an anticoagulant, at the time when Dr. Devereux did the study, it was warfarin, you increase strokes in 100 patients to 4. In other words, 8 fewer strokes, you're preventing, in 100 patients, you're preventing 4 major strokes and 4 minor strokes. And the question is, how many serious gastrointestinal bleeds would you be willing to accept in 100 patients and still be willing to recommend or use more for it? Okay? Any questions about what, what I'm asking you? Any clarification needed? No? Okay. So, how many to prevent the eight strokes, how many would accept five or fewer bleeds? In other words, if it's more than five bleeds, no thank you, we'll pass up the warfarin. Okay? How many would accept five or fewer bleeds? Anybody? Nobody would accept five or fewer. How many would accept five to ten bleeds? Okay. I don't know, three, 
40 percent in that vicinity. How many would accept 10 to 15 bleeds? Oh, even more, okay? Most of this audience is 10 to 15 bleeds. How many 15 to 20? Anybody? Anybody over 20? Okay. So, uh, the, uh, about a third, perhaps maybe a third of the audience, 5 to 10, and a third, 10 to 15. Well, here's what happened when Dr. Devereux asked his physicians and patients. The physicians are in this green-bluish color, and what you see with it is basically a flat distribution. Some were less than five, okay, nobody here. Uh, the majority with, they were with this audience here, five to 15, and a few were in the 15 to 20. Very, very different with the patients. Two-thirds of the patients were ready to accept 22 bleeds to prevent eight strokes. You may ask, why 22? Seems like an odd number. Well, when Dr. Devereux decided, uh, designed the study, he was thinking like a physician. He thought nobody would go higher than 22. If you had given the patients the chance, they would have gone higher than 22, a substantial proportion. What are the messages here? The messages are that the patients are much more stroke averse than the clinicians. The clinicians are much more bleeding averse than are the patients. Now that's one message. It implies that if we use the physician's values and preferences, we're not going to be making choices that are consistent with the patient values and preferences. The other message is we'll be much better off using the average patient values than the average physician values, but some of the patients have values and preferences closer to the physicians, some of them are also bleeding averse, and if we want to get it right for the individual patient, we have to consider the individual patient's values and preferences. So, um, messages so far, and these are what I call the three basic principles of evidence-based medicine. One, a hierarchy of evidence. Some evidence is more trustworthy than others. We need systematic summaries of the best evidence to get it, our management right. And even once we've got that, we don't know what to do unless we can put it in the context of the patient's values and preferences. Well, uh, next issue that folks have addressed is how can we provide evidence efficiently. And when evidence-based medicine got started, it was maybe a little bit of a hoax. And the reason it was a hoax is people could not get the evidence efficiently. So there'll be uh, people in the audience that are nearer to my vintage who will remember going to the library and cooking out huge books of Index Medicus. Who, who remembers that in this uh, audience? Okay, quite a few. Okay, you remember, that's not, you're not going to be really able to do uh, evidence-based medicine. But fortunately, in the 25 years since um, the term, uh, since we coined the term, there's been an information revolution. Uh, we are preventing, you know, Brian Haynes has contributed to the structured abstracts you'll now see in major journals. Before abstracts, the authors could say anything they felt like it. Now we have structured abstracts. And we have information resources that make things, a whole bunch that make things uh, very efficient. How many people in this room subscribe to any information source where they send you, you get on your emails, new information as it comes out. How many people in this audience? Okay, good. Almost all the audience, right? This is an information revolution. Brian Haynes has been very instrumental in doing this. Um, so, what kind of information um, should we be giving people? Well, if we are going to be efficient, clinicians a lot of the time need direct guidance, such as clinical practice guidelines. Um, uh, but they need, they need education in how to interpret information from original studies, from systematic reviews, and what they see in the guidelines. So education has been a major part of evidence-based medicine. Um, these are the, a, larger, uh, a larger and a smaller book uh, that uh, our group has produced. 
um, that uh, is, one, is one educational source for training people in the principles of using the medical literature. So, um, next development that happened, Dr. Sackett came up with a very compelling, but perhaps in retrospect, somewhat oversimplified hierarchy of evidence. And the next question is, can we be more sophisticated in judging the credibility of the evidence? Uh, these two individuals, Andy Oxman and Holger Schunemann, have been instrumental in uh, developing and disseminating a new, more sophisticated approach to judging the evidence. And it is a group called GRADE, uh, which is a, what's been developed is a system to judge the confidence in the estimates of effect, quality of evidence from systematic reviews, and moving from those systematic reviews to recommendations or guidelines for clinical care. Uh, this was introduced in the BMJ in 2004, and a little more than a decade later, over 90 organizations worldwide have, uh, are using the great approach. How many people in this room use up-to-date? Okay, almost everybody in the room, uh, 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 and a lot of people don't notice it, but there are over 9,500 graded recommendations using this great approach in up-to-date. Others, folks who have adopted it, including the Cochrane Collaboration, um, a number of major American organizations, American College of Physicians, World Health Organization. So lots of people are using it, and if you look closely, you will see these graded recommendations uh, very prominent in up to date. This is the system, the more sophisticated system, uh, a new hierarchy of evidence. In the great approach, randomized trials start as high quality evidence high confidence, high certainty in the evidence, but they may not stay that way. So, if the trials are not well done, unconcealed randomization, not blinded, large losses to follow up, we may rate down our confidence or quality of the evidence for risk of bias. If the results differ from study to study, we lose confidence. If the uh, patients that are enrolled in the studies are different, from uh, our patients. How many people in this room uh, practice general internal medicine? Okay, quite a few. How many practice geriatrics? Don't see anybody. Of those who practice general internal medicine, how many sometimes feel like they're practicing geriatrics? Okay. Right. <laughs> so the issue is we're seeing a lot more people over 80, a lot more people over 90, starting to see people over 100, not that infrequently. And one of the questions we may have is the randomized trials didn't have very many people over 80. And to what extent can we apply the results of randomized trials to our geriatric patients. So that would be an issue of indirectness. Imprecision, small <coughs> sample sizes, small number of trials, wide confidence intervals, <coughs> and we can get everything else right and unfortunately still be misled by publication bias. Observational studies in this approach start as low quality but may be rated up, particularly for large effects. So, for instance, uh, we do not need randomized trials to know that dialysis makes people who have terminal renal failure live longer. Uh, we do not need randomized trials to know that people dying of respiratory failure will live longer, sometimes not that much longer, but will live longer if we intubate and ventilate them. We don't need randomized trials to know that people who are suffering from chronic debilitating hip pain are going to benefit from hip replacement. So there are situations when observational studies can actually reveal high quality evidence. So this is a much more sophisticated way of looking at evidence than the old hierarchy of evidence. So um, the, another of the outputs, I think very important outputs of GRADE, has been how you then present the evidence. This happens to be what we call an evidence profile for the question of should patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery receive beta blockers? And what you see here is that for the outcome of myocardial infarction, 
There have been over 10,000 patients in nine studies. We have these issues of risk of bias, consistency, directness, precision, and publication bias. No problems in any of them. High quality evidence, a 29% relative risk reduction translates into, uh, in a 1,000 a in a patients, 15 fewer myocardial infarctions. Mortality, also 10,000 patients, but here we have a problem with precision. Uh, the, our, our point estimate is unfortunately a 20% relative increase in deaths with these beta blockers, moderate quality evidence because the confidence intergulf goes from a 2% relative risk reduction to a 55% increase. So we're not sure. Our best guess is an increase in mortality, but we are much less certain because of this wide confidence interval. If it's true, it would mean five additional deaths in a thousand. Non-fatal stroke, uh, again, we have a, a confidence interval that borders on no effect, but unfortunately, again, a 67% increase in stroke, which would be three in a thousand more strokes. So here we see there's a trade-off. You're going to prevent some myocardial infarctions, but you're quite possibly going to cause deaths and quite likely cause strokes. Again, a value and preference sensitive decision about using beta blockers in patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery. So, uh, next issue is, so we've got our evidence, we've got our summaries of evidence, how can we guide clinicians in their use? And GRADE provides a structure for this, uh, strong recommendations, clearly uh, the benefits clearly outweigh the downsides or the reverse. And you will also have weak recommendation if there's low quality evidence or if there's a close balance between the desirable and undesirable consequences. And what would your guess be? Up to date has uh, 9,500 graded recommendations. What proportion do you think are strong recommendations? Anybody care to make a guess? Who says less than 25%? Okay. Who says 25 to 50%? Who says more than 50%? Okay, very good. Uh, it's about a third, actually. A third of up-to-date recommendations are strong. Two-thirds are weak, meaning most situations we either don't have confidence in our effects or there are close calls. So. What do, you, what do the strong and weak recommendations mean? What they, one thing we think, one way of looking at them is they have to do with variability in patient preferences. If a guideline panel or if up to date has got it right, in a strong recommendation, everyone or virtually everyone who is fully informed, all fully informed patients would make the same choice in a weak recommendation, either because the quality of the evidence is low or the trade-offs are very are close, uh, uh, in a, in, and there's a weak recommendation, different patients would make different choices. That means if the guideline panel or if up-to-date has got it right, in your interaction with the patients, a strong recommendation, you don't need to spend a lot of time on shared decision-making because if the panel has got it right at the end of that exercise, everyone or virtually everyone would make the same choice. And we all know we're very time constrained. However, despite being time constrained, if we go on to get things right, if there's a weak recommendation, we have to engage the patient in shared decision making to ensure that the decision is consistent with the patient values and preferences. How do we do that? It's not easy at times. Uh, to communicate the information and more and more decision aids and more sophisticated decision aids are becoming available. And I'll talk more about that in a little while. Uh, strong recommendations might not be a good use of time because if the panel has got it right, everybody's going to make the same work choice, but it would be very good in a uh, weak recommendation. And more and more we're judging quality of care. Strong recommendations are candidates for quality of care criteria. We should be doing the same thing. Weak recommendations shouldn't be quality of care criteria because the right thing to do differs across patients. Next issue, um, how then are we going, so we, we've identified 
that most up-to-date recommendations are weak, they're sensitive to values and preferences, how are we going to make sure our decisions are consistent with individual uh, values and preference? Next gentleman here is Victor Montori, trained with us for a couple of years at McMaster, has gone back to the Mayo Clinic and has been, in my view, a genius of coming up with efficient ways to make the decisions consistent with patient values and preferences. And here is, um, uh, uh, just before I get to exactly the way Victor does it, guidelines, we can only use average values and preferences, but at the point of care, we can try to individualize. And here is Victor's approach to individualizing in patients with diabetes. Victor has these cards, and in this treatment he has uh, uh, a couple of years old, there's more, more treatments now, but at that time there were five categories of treatments. And these cards show patients what happens to your blood pressure, your weight, your daily routine, your low blood sugar, how often you get low blood sugar, sugar testing, and side effects with the different uh, classes of medications. And Victor starts off saying to the patients, which card would you like to see first? Anybody have any guesses as to the card most frequently chosen first? Weight change, right. Okay. So here's what happens with weight change. Metformin doesn't do much. Insulin, here's on average what you gain. Glitazones, you're going to gain even more. Exenatide, you're going to lose weight. Self-auditory is a modest weight gain. The patient might next choose what it does to the daily routine, and we'll find out that some are oral and some are injectable, and then they may want to ask about low blood sugars, which are unpleasant events, and find out that with insulin and sulfonylureas it happens a lot, and with the others it does not happen very much at all. Victor tells me that typically after three cards, maybe four, the patient says, I don't need to see the other two <laughs> cards, I know what I want to do. Okay? And the, the whole process, under 10 minutes, often five minutes, to get a value and preference sensitive decision on the part of the patients. So, um, up to date produces these guidelines, nice. Um, uh, very widely used, uh, very accessible, but perhaps we could even do better and perhaps other guideline organizations aside from up to date that produce the guidelines to an extent that feed up to date, the American Heart Association, just about all medical associations now, might be doing better. And a guy who is leading the charge in that area is Per Van Veek who is uh, a now, again, trained with us for a while, now back in Norway. We produced a few years ago the American College of Chest Physicians' ninth iteration of the antithrombotic guidelines. They were grade-based. We thought we were producing a great guideline. But you either got the paper version or you got a PDF. And, for instance, the evidence summaries look like this. So you have to turn your head or, turn, or switch the page not really very user-friendly. So we produced this great guideline, but is the guideline available, useful, and understandable for clinicians? Well, maybe to a limited extent. Is it suited for integration into an electronic medical records, EBM textbooks, and adaptation? Not very well. Is it sufficiently up-to-date? No, it was produced a few years ago now, half the recommendations are definitely outdated. Is there anything in there to really facilitate shared decision making? No. So, can we correct these? How can we make grade irresistible for clinicians, patients, and guideline developers? Perhaps what we need is magic. Um, and that's the name of Pierre Van Beek's research program. MAGIC stands for Making Grade the Irresistible Choice. Okay, and here's how the group is going to do it. They, uh, we're now developing, and Pear's group has a MAGIC app, which is an electronic database, and so it breaks all the elements of the guideline into chunks analogous to uh, Lego blocks, and once you have all the elements in the guideline in these chunks, you can put them on 
all your smartphones and you can integrate them into the electronic medical record and you can easily adapt them so PEAR has adapted our anti-thrombotic guidelines to Norway uh, uh, and used the magic app to do that and we might get, and this is what we're working on now, uh, semi-automated decision aids for patients and clinicians and that's the last thing I'm going to tell you about um, this is a guy who's just finishing his PhD with us now, uh, Thomas Agaritsis, working closely with PEAR in Norway. Nowadays you can have these international collaborations very easily. Um, and what Thomas has done is to take advantage of three uh, simultaneous developments. One is the produce, production of systematic reviews based on great principles. And remember that evidence profile I showed you about beta blockers in non-cardiac surgery? Once you have it structured like that, you have the information structured like that, it's very easy to move it around and to create summaries, as you'll see in a moment, that can be efficient for patients and clinicians. Secondly, we use Victor's uh, genius imagination of the way we, the principles that are in that diabetes to present the information to the patients. And we use the magic app or some related system that produces a structured electronic database. Those three things coming together uh, have the potential for a revolution in decision aids presented to patients on iPads. That's what Thomas is, explore, uh, 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 is um, uh, working with semi-automated production and it also allows once you have all that information in the electronic structure you can very rapidly update it with new information so here's one that we have one of these things that we have tested this is what it looks like on your iPad for the patients and clinician and Victor's principle what aspect of your medication would you like to discuss this is rivaroxaban an anticoagulant versus no treatment once you've had a VTE and after six months should you continue with your anticoagulant or should you not? What would you like to talk about first? Well, in the end, the patient will find out what the impact of rivaroxaban versus uh, no rivaroxaban would be on death rates, on recurrence, and on major bleeds. And they found out the point estimate, the confidence interval, and an estimate of the quality of the evidence otherwise known as the certainty in effect. And you may say, well, patients may not be that numerate, they may have difficulty grasping that, so we have visual representations uh, that would help. So here are uh, a thousand patients, so 987 will avoid recurrent uh, DVT, but so most people, even if you don't take your river oxygen, most people are not going to get a, re a recurrent VTE. But the number, uh, uh, the number here in this sort of orangish color represents the people who would have DVT without river oxygen, who would not have DVT if they use river oxygen, uh, 58 uh, fewer in a thousand patients. And turns out so far in, I guess what it's still you would call pilot testing, this is working as a decision aid for clinicians and their patients. And finally, a uh, theme of this uh, that I hope I've touched on is evidence-based medicine is a requirement for optimal research, for optimal education. We need to educate people, clinicians, and now more and more patients in these principles and for clinical care. And we start with the basic, this is a schema that uh, uh, many of us are now calling an evidence ecosystem. And this evidence ecosystem starts with basic research, uh, which tells us, gives us candidate treatments that can then be tested in randomized trials, ideally in observational studies. But as we have demonstrated, these individual studies are limited. They need to be uh, uh, summarized in high-quality systematic reviews, such as those produced by the Cochrane Collaboration. And clinicians, to a large extent, need and value uh, guidelines such as UpToDate produces, 
So we need to go from systematic reviews to trustworthy guidelines. And in this process, we need to educate clinicians so that they can understand the output of individual studies, but in particular systematic reviews and guidelines. And we need to make these guidelines very accessible, more accessible than they've been. Up to date does pretty well, but hopefully we will get them more accessible, uh, uh, not only up to date guidelines, but the ones that um, the ones that appear uh, on the organizational guidelines and. Uh, uh, get them into the in, 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 uh, medical records, the electronic medical records, so that they are highly accessible, and then get them into the sort of decision aids that we're working on now that Thomas Agaritzis is leading uh, for patient care. And then all that can feed into quality improvement, uh, and what comes out of this can feed into the questions that basic research should be addressing. So, in conclusion, the three principles of evidence-based healthcare are widely acknowledged. Uh, the hierarchy of evidence, we've got a much more sophisticated hierarchy of evidence represented by GRADE, which we believe is a major advance. We have to have systematic summaries and guidelines that need to be rapidly updated. Uh, ongoing user testing will optimize the presentation formats and incorporation in the electronic medical records of the future will enhance access. And we need to recognize the importance of patient values and preferences. Uh, point of care decision aids may be the ideal solution. Uh, it may also help having these decision aids where the evidence is there may very well help the educational focus on EBM in terms of clinicians and their patients understanding the best evidence on which decisions should be made. Um, I don't see a clock in here. Um, how have I got Okay, so happy to take questions. Ça a toujours été un exemple de, 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 de finir à temps ces présentations. Euh, on tient beaucoup à votre feedback, les questions, les commentaires. S'il y a des commentaires, je vous demanderai de le faire au micro pour qu'on puisse les enregistrer, puis si c'est nécessaire, je traduis. Last, last year, I read an article by Gorski in Trends in Molecular Medicine, suggesting the word evidence-based medicine was being misused by people like Heather Boone at Toronto that puts uh, clinical trials at the top of, uh, of the hierarchy, forgetting about the scientific plausibility, and use that to validate, uh, for example, homeopathic uh, uh, treatments, uh, clinical trials, which are a waste of money. Uh, so what, what take you have on that? To, to call to, to find ways to put the scientific plausibility of treatments much more evident? Well, um, in general, uh, I could tell you dozens of stories, probably literally, of uh, treatments that have had very high plausibility. I told you one story about the lidocaine, which everybody believed because of scientific plausibility, when, if anything, it was killing people and there are many such stories. So, um, uh, the, so pl biologic plausibility, I would say, is necessary but far from sufficient. So, there is a story that would, uh, and, and um, so there is the story that there is, homeopathy is potentially a problem in terms of lack of credibility, but again, um, you don't, I don't think there are very many examples that you would dismiss from that. So, and, and things, get, um, uh, things get well established so that one thinks that it's the only way of doing things. So we're just finishing now a systematic review of antibiotics versus appendectomy for appendicitis. Forever, appendectomy was the only thing to do. Who would consider not doing it? As it turns out, there's a real, it's a value and preference sensitive decision as it turns out, an appendectomy versus, uh, versus antibiotics. Bottom line is 
yes, you need minimal, you need at least minimal biologic plausibility, but biologic plausibility is certainly far from sufficient. Okay. Uh, Eric Dallin from Internal Medicine, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Giat, for a fascinating talk. Uh, one question concerning hierarchy of evidence. Uh, observational studies seem always to get the low boot. And I have on my desk uh, papers from the New England Journal of Medicine from 2010, which I'm trying actually to read, but which you are probably aware. In that issue of the New England, there were two papers where they would look systematically at observational studies in which the interventions that were uh, studied were also studied in uh, randomized controlled trials and they look at the estimates of either benefit or harm and compare the results of the observational studies with the randomized controlled trials and the, actually the estimates fit most of the time very very well so my question to you is, aren't we uh, too disparaging uh, towards the evidence coming from observational studies? Well, the problem is, you're right, that most of the time the observational studies, um, if they're really well done and everything else, very well done, large samples, etc., representative samples, etc., most of the time they match the randomized trials. The trouble is, Sometimes they don't. And until you do the randomized trials, you're not sure if this is one of the situations where it's going to match or one of the situations where it's not going to match. And, for instance, if we had believed the observational studies, we'd still be giving out beta blockers to people undergoing non-cardiac surgery in, belief, in the belief that we are reducing deaths when we're probably increasing them. We'd still be giving hormone replacement therapy to women uh, substantially past the menopause in the belief that we were reducing cardiovascular risk when in fact we are increasing it. We'd still be giving out antioxidant vitamins in the belief that we would be reducing uh, cardiovascular deaths and cancer when we're certainly not decreasing and with some of the fat soluble vitamins we're probably having adverse effects. And I could go on. So, um, yes, most of the time it matches, but some of the time it doesn't match. And if we're going to rely on the observational studies, sometimes we're going to be disastrously wrong. Yes, but random miscatural trials can also be wrong at times. And sometimes ah, absolutely. And that's why the old hierarchy is, was, it was very problematic, right? So now I told you about the five reasons that alert you to when randomized trials may be wrong. They may be poorly done with high risk of bias, they may give inconsistent results, they may be indirect and not apply to your population, uh, 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 there may be publication bias. So now we're taking a much more sophisticated look at randomized trials and they can be more or less trustworthy as well, absolutely. I'm Marie Giroux from Family Medicine. Thank you for your great talk. Um, in primary care, we're kind of struggling with uh, numerous cases. Almost all patients have multimorbidity, and some specific guidelines, if we follow them, even with strong evidence and the patient being really willing to, to follow them, will become just in opposition with the other guideline. And you kind of think that if you follow one, then you patient's going to fall and you know that in the end that patient doesn't take this medication so well. So taking care of, taking into account all those uh, uh, variables, do you have some comments to do? And we're, we're, you have to know that in our uh, medical school we're taking the turn of a more generalist approach in uh, undergrad education. So. Um, yeah, it's a great point. Uh, Victor Montori, who I told you about, who was doing, I think, this wonderful work uh, with uh, trying to align values and preferences has come up with, uh, or he and other folks have come up with the concept of minimally intrusive medicine. Um, and I recommend going to, if you want to hear Victor's talk, go to, you know it, do you? He did the last uh, NAPRAX preliminary session, which is I found on YouTube. Yeah, so Victor has the, what, these wonderful YouTube talks about this minimally intrusive medicine. And absolutely, 
um, we need to be, and in, perhaps particularly in primary care, but all of us have to be aware that it is a problem when you give a patient, as can easily happen, 20 medications to try and manage as part of their lives. And things then become value and preference sensitive to say, okay, how do you feel about taking all this medication? How do you feel about the risks of side effects? Which for you might be more important and which for you might be less important? So it's absolute. So that a rote application of guidelines, okay, we'll follow what the cardiovascular guideline says and we'll follow what the diabetes guideline says and we'll follow what the osteoporosis guideline says. By the time you do that, the, the, the patient's life is medication. So, um, so definitely a rote application of individual guidelines is, pro is certainly not the optimal approach. Other than the technology, uh, I think it's essential actually to systematize the values and preferences of patients and the guidelines and also the, all the system. Now, there's clash, however, between this and social values. For example, you, you mentioned the example of sulfonylurea. Uh, most patients will not take it or would not take it given the evidence. Yet, we need to prescribe it sometimes because of cost issues. And, you know, we have the algorithm for reimbursement of drugs that we have to follow. And therefore, there's a clash between what society should choose and what the patients might choose. And this is becoming more acute with these very expensive new medication, gene therapy, etc. Like I have one therapy, for example, in some of the conditions which cost one and a half million dollars for, for this. So if you ask the patient, these people will say yes all the time because they want to prevent meningitis, etc. Society will say no. So we have to try and find a way also to balance these values and see how we can accommodate or perhaps use evidence based medicine at a higher level uh, to try and convince our governments and society in general uh, what is the best balance to strike. Uh, I, I think it's a great point, and uh, 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 if there are easy answers to your question, I don't know them, okay? So you, you've labeled, but what evidence-based medicine can do is lay out accurately what the benefits and downsides are and our certainty or confidence in them. So uh, uh, just uh, apropos of your question, there was a decision made by the Ontario government um, not to fund uh, a anti-breast anti cancer treatment for very low-risk women and people got very upset about it and in the write-up on it, it blamed the evidence-based medicine people for this. Well, I wrote a uh, letter to the editor about this and said, look, all we've done is lay out the benefits and risks if as a society, a government or a society, they decide, okay, it's not worth it given the payment, that's a decision which may be right or wrong, but don't blame us. All we have done is lay out the benefits and risk. Then you have societal value and preference judgments, which I think, as you pointed out, are extremely challenging. Yes, thank you for an excellent talk. Um, I'm more of a statistician, and I'll ask a question a little bit from that vein. It seems to me that despite this excellent overall framework, there's a bit of a problem because at each level, from the visual study, the meta-analysis, and the review up on through it, you've got individuals, fallible humans, coming around the table to make fallible decisions, and you're adding error at each level. But when you get to the final piece of information the clinician actually sees, it's not clear whether that error that got added has reached a point where the signal is lost or whether you still got what ends up being a useful signal. And I have a suggestion for how to deal with that, which is you, you can test it, because now with the latest tools that you're describing, you could, when there's any doubt around the table of, of, for clinical recommendation, implement randomly in the apps two different versions and follow, at least in some cases, cases the patient outcomes. Uh, have you any thoughts along those lines? Yeah, so um, these are, um, uh, so 
uh, one can do, and people have done, randomized trials of people expose essentially a guideline approach versus without the guideline approach. Um, that, in my view, is would be very appropriate for weak recommendations based on low quality evidence. Once you've got the high quality evidence, I don't want to see people exposed to a, 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 exposed to being uh, guided to give aspirin and to people with myocardial infarction or not aspirin. Okay? There's some places where the answer is in. Where the answer is not in, that's definitely a possibility. I guess I was thinking more along the lines of when we're not sure, is that a strong or a weak recommendation? Which must come up quite a lot because you just got two categories and you've got a whole variety of actual strengths. Well, uh, yes, except uh, the weak recommendation is uh, it's hard to go wrong with a weak recommendation. A weak recommendation means think about it and talk to your patient. How can that be wrong? Okay, so we reserve the strong recommendations for when we're really sure. Annabelle. Annabelle Cummins, I'm the internist and also chair of the ERB. A question for you, taking you back to your slide on thrombolytics, where we had another 30 studies that you probably shouldn't have. What is the situation like now? Who, who's looking out for the fact that we're not doing too many studies before we stop doing? Well, I, 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 I really believe that the um, systematic reviews uh, and um, uh, the systematic reviews have gone, and the fact that now more and more granting agencies, for instance, are insisting that there be a systematic review there before you say what you're going to do next, um, and and we need them rap. And now we're getting good at rapidly updating them, so we don't have to, you know, there's no no delay. So my, my answer to avoiding doing that is make sure you have a systematic summary of the best evidence, and sometimes that may be uh, that may that may tell you very clearly what to do, and you don't need to go further. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gaet. On arrive à la fin. Uh, we're, we're coming to the end of your presentation. Um, euh, ceux qui voudront lui parler pourront peut-être rester s'il reste un peu de temps. Je voulais juste euh, vous remercier d'être là. Puis bon, sur les sites distants, des, euh, euh, <rire> merci d'avoir été là aussi. Pour nous, c'était particulièrement important d'accueillir le Dr. Gaët et d'avoir cette présentation parce que ça euh, identifie bien le, le, euh, les conditions auxquelles, euh, les con ce que ça prend finalement pour que euh, ben, la, la nouvelles connaissances est un impact en bout de ligne. Dans la, la diapositive avec le grand cycle, vous voyez qu'il y a un rôle à jouer là-dedans pour des chercheurs à différents niveaux, en sciences fondamentales, en sciences cliniques, mais qu'on est loin d'être arrivé au but quand on a généré des nouvelles données. Euh, ça demande une espèce d'interaction assez intense avec euh, 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 quand on a notre chapeau de donneur de soins. Euh, alors, l'évaluation des coûts hein, qui est en jeu, le Dr Carpentier en a parlé, euh, qui, qui, qui est quelque chose qu'un administrateur aura à considérer, que nous, on n'a pas toujours à considérer quand on soit un malade. Une interaction aussi avec les enseignants, parce qu'on ne peut pas atteindre ça si euh, le médecin, euh, l'administrateur et même les patients et leurs familles n'ont pas un minimum d'informations pour être capable de peser les avantages et les inconvénients. Et donc, c'est une espèce de travail d'équilibriste. Et le, le centre de recherche est un petit peu dans un endroit névralgique parce que le centre de recherche est situé à l'intersection entre l'enseignement, puis la recherche, puis la clinique avec l'hôpital. Euh, C'est un dialogue qui, qui, qui commence, qui devrait continuer, puis qu'on espère pouvoir bonifier avec les années parce que euh, quand ça marche, ça peut vraiment bien fonctionner. Puis bon, le docteur Gaët et son équipe et les gens de McMaster sont clairement un, un exemple d'un success story dans ce domaine-là. Bien qu'il serait le premier à vous dire qu'il y a du travail à faire, nous, je sens qu'on est en train de, 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 de réussir de mieux en mieux cette espèce d'intégration-là. Donc, j'espère que le dialogue va continuer après cette, cette présentation. Euh, Mr. Gaët, uh, as director of the Research Center, uh, I have the privilege of uh, thanking you formally for your outstanding presentation. Uh, as a switching into the confessional mode, uh, I can say that uh, I was part of that sort of 1990s generation that surfed on the uh, people like uh, Ian Chalmers, and in fact, Murray Enkin, who's one of the people who perhaps could be on your screen as well. Murray, an obstetrician gynecologist from McMaster, who, uh, along with his wife, Eleanor, during a sabbatical year in Oxford, 
prepared the first uh, database of clinical trials in the perinatal area, which was essentially the prototype for the Cochrane system. So your group at McMaster, uh, yourself and, and the other members of the team have inspired a whole generation of, of thinking. And you also, with your vision as to what, what can be done, should be done, is continuing to push us forward. So thank you very much for all of the work and for an outstanding presentation.